Ken Ham is getting the feeling that the whole world is against him. First it was Bill Nye, then Neil deGrasse Tyson. And now the British government has banned creationism from being taught in schools. Ken knows why they are doing this. It's because they all hate God. They want to sin, take drugs, drink, pinch, punch, stab and shoot, dance naked in the woods at midnight, marry their pets, watch Harry Potter films and burn in hell for all eternity. They are trying their hardest to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. But Ken knows the truth. It is written in his Bible. Or is it? Ken's answers in Genesis has a statement of faith. If you want to work for answers in Genesis, in a paid or voluntary capacity, Ken will tell you what you must believe. And one of the things you must believe is that the 66 books of the Bible are the written word of God. The Bible is divinely inspired and inerrant throughout. Its assertions are factually true in all the original autographs. The Oxford English Dictionary defines autograph as that which is written in a person's own handwriting, the author's own manuscript. So in the context of the Bible, all Ken's minions must declare that the Bible is inerrant in the original handwritten manuscript of the author. In the case of Genesis, that would of course be Moses, who supposedly wrote the creation account down sometime in the 15th century BCE. Has Ken seen a copy of Moses' original autograph? Of course not. The oldest scraps of Genesis found are in the Dead Sea Scrolls, dated to one and a half thousand years after the dates given for Moses. The oldest Pentateuch we have is from two thousand years after the dates given for Moses, and are in Latin and Greek translation, not Hebrew. In fact, Hebrew itself did not emerge from the earlier Phoenician script until the 10th century BCE, and then not in a form you would recognize. Biblical Hebrew developed through stages identified as archaic, the 10th to the 6th century, standard, the 8th to the 6th century, and late, the 5th to the 3rd century. These styles can be differentiated by paleographers who've identified sections of the Bible expressing the archaic style, including the Song of Moses and the Song of Deborah. The bulk of the Pentateuch was written in the style of standard Biblical Hebrew and not archaic. Of course, none of this means that Moses did not write the Pentateuch in some pre-Phoenician language, which is lost, and that the clear meaning of his words was then faithfully reproduced and translated through the centuries. But it does mean that no one on earth can make the claim that the 66 books of the Bible are the written word of God, the Bible is divinely inspired and inerrant throughout, its assertions are factually true in all the original autographs. Ah, but this is a statement of faith. Faith in this context meaning accepting that for which there is no evidence. And this is a problem. If you want to join Ken's team, you must accept as fact that for which there is no evidence and then defend it against any evidence which refutes the facts. How far will Ken go to defend his truth? Let's read Ken's piece on the banning of creationism in UK schools and pick out a couple of highlights. Ken's first gripe is that evolution isn't even a theory. Not just a theory, it isn't even a theory. To uphold this statement, Ken defines what a theory is. A theory has its genesis in a hypothesis, which is a working assumption as to why we observe something, an educated guess. To test this assumption, scientists conduct experiments that either disprove or correlate with the hypothesis. He expands, but that's enough. This is Ken's chosen definition, I'll let it stand for now. He does neglect to mention that creationism and Noah's flood has been disproven by every branch of modern science, but I'll let that slip. Ken then continues with where evolution falls short. Two problems prevent anyone from legitimately calling evolution a theory. First, there's no direct observable experiment that can ever be performed. Scientists can measure bones, study mutations, decode DNA and notice similarities in morphology, the form and structure of animals and plants, but they can never test evolutionary events in the past. And there I shall pull Ken up. We all understand the scientific method to be about repeatable and falsifiable experimentation and observation. 
The Oxford English Dictionary defines the scientific method as a method or procedure that has characterised natural science since the 17th century, consisting in systematic observation, measurement and experiment, and the formulation, testing and modification of hypotheses. This might well call to your mind a picture of scientists in a laboratory or at the LHC conducting test after test under predetermined conditions. But this is not what experiment means. A natural experiment can be as simple as the observation of phenomena outside the control of the experimenter, where an empirical study of effects leads to or confirms a hypothesis as to the causes of those effects. Often it is the effect which is being examined and the cause which is being sought. One of the most famous experiments in history was a natural experiment, rather than a scientific experiment as we commonly think of it. In 1854 there was a major cholera outbreak in London, during which over 600 people died. A London physician, John Snow, using nothing more than a map and a list of victims, was able to theorise that a contaminated water supply was to blame for the outbreak. Snow did not carry out any experiment in the normal sense of the word. His statistical analysis showed a cluster of victims at a certain location. At that location was a public water pump. Snow had hypothesized that cholera was a waterborne disease. The observation of the historic data supported his hypothesis. Of course, there could have been a number of other explanations for the observations which John Snow made, but he was correct and he is now known as a father of modern epidemiology for that reason. The point I hope is clear. The scientific method does not require that experimentation is carried out in the here and now under conditions determined by the experimenter. It requires only that an empirical study be carried out subject to specific principles such that future studies are able to confirm or falsify the results of that experiment. And of course all the educated individuals working to Ken Ham's orders know all of this very well. They choose to lie about the facts to the uneducated and gullible because it suits their agenda and their bank balances. Just as John Snow looked at dead bodies and stuck pins in a map to build up a pattern and determine what most likely happened in the past, so modern scientists can view the wealth of evidence from geology, paleontology, genetics and more, stick pins in their maps and look for patterns which develop into a theory. And just like John Snow, if modern scientists find data which falsifies their theory, their theory is proven wrong. The theory of evolution is a good example of this. Mountains of evidence have been collected across a broad spectrum of scientific disciplines and all of it confirms, and not one piece of it falsifies, Darwin's original hypothesis of evolution through natural selection. Darwin of course had no understanding of the mechanisms of heredity and so lent on Lamarckism to explain variability where we now know it to be due to random mutations. This is a good example of how the described mechanism or cause of an observed phenomena might well be modified by future discoveries without invalidating the observed phenomena itself. So Ken's first argument is dismantled. A direct observable experiment is not required for a scientific theory to be valid. Ken goes on to say, some point to natural selection as a form of evolution in action, but natural selection can only act upon the genetic potential that already exists. Of course, random genetic mutations change that genetic potential, so let's skip on. What we do observe from natural selection fits perfectly with a recent creation and does not point to common descent. Okay, let's look at that a bit deeper. In particular here, I want to look at the llama and the camel to see how they perfectly fit with a recent creation and do not point to common descent. If we look at Ken's kiddie indoctrination pages, we will see that the llama was created by God on day six of the creation week. That's sorted then, just so the kids know. Of course, no one was there to see the llama being created and llamas are absent from the Bible, along with every other animal not native to the immediate geographic region inhabited by the Hebrews, but Ken knows that the llama was created on day six. A little further on, he says, 
Some believe the camel to have evolved from the llama. However, these two animals are probably from the same animal kind created on day six of creation week. So now the llama wasn't created on day six, but a llama camel or camel llama was, as Ken just contradicted himself. And is he now saying that the modern llama and camel are both descended from a llama camel kind, i.e. that there is common descent? No wonder creationist kids are so confused. Is Ken saying that a llama camel evolved into the llamas, alpacas, one humped and two humped camels we see in the fossil record? Then they were all killed in the flood apart from one llama camel pair which had not evolved and the remains of which no one has ever discovered which then again evolved into identical llamas, alpacas and one and two hump camels as before. It gets better when we look at AIG's page on the camel. Camels. Confirmation of creation. It is a dry, hot day in the desert. There is no water in sight. The wind is thick with sand and the dunes continually shift underfoot. These conditions prove no problem for the camel. And if we skip to the bottom, the camel and its specialized equipment highlight the incredible design features which evolutionists must explain as the result of random mutations selected by the environment. The camel today is perfectly adapted to its unique desert environment, and it is hard to see how all the features it requires, long eyelashes, thick hair, wide padded feet, fat storage in the hump, and sophisticated body temperature mechanisms could have come by a gradual evolutionary process. Ken is describing the perfect camel here. It is a bit of a problem for Ken to explain why the camel, whichever camel he is referring to, would need to be created with all that very specific survival equipment in the oh-so-climatically perfect Garden of Eden. And is Ken saying that his llama camel kind, created on day six, had all these wonderful survival features? Long eyelashes, thick hair, wide padded feet, fat storage in the hump? and sophisticated body temperature mechanisms, meaning that they were in fact camels and not llama camels, or indeed llamas, as he previously emphatically tells the kids on his child's indoctrination page. Or perhaps were there llama camels in Eden, as he contradictorily also tells the kids, which then evolved humps, padded feet, etc., not once, but twice, once before the flood, from where we find all the fossils, and again after the flood, meaning that they were not perfectly designed from day one, or six, and more significantly meaning that rather than camels having come about by a gradual evolutionary process, they now had to evolve rapidly before the flood, and after the flood had to evolve again in just a few generations so that Abraham could be seen riding around on them. Ken is getting himself into a fix with camels and llamas for obvious reasons. Even his pet biologists have to admit that llamas and camels are very closely related. He therefore cannot have them both on the ark. If he allowed animals that closely related on the ark, he would have to follow the same rules across the animal kingdom, and he knows he'd run out of room before he'd stored the first consignment from Madagascar. And so his team have decided that camelids are one of Noah's kinds. This includes the extant species of Bactrian camels, dromedary, llama, guanaco, alpaca and vicuna, together with all extinct species. Whatever came off Noah's Ark, they apparently started walking slowly across Arabia, procreating and evolving furiously as they did so. A couple of them grew humps and stayed in the Middle East, the rest marched on across 4,000 miles of deserts and mountains until they had grown another hump and decided to stop in Mongolia. Some of these ships of the desert then set sail across 12,000 miles of the Pacific Ocean to arrive in South America, now devoid of all humps. I think the journey took seven days, or you can make up your own story. Or you might consider evolutionary theory, which is backed up by paleontology, geology, comparative anatomy, biology, reality, etc., etc. This has the camelids originating in North America, where the earliest fossils have been found. They then migrated into Asia, across the Bering Strait, evolving into the camels we now know, 
and separately south to evolve into the guanaco and vicuna of south america there's no chicken and egg question a study of the genetic mutations accumulating within the gene pool of the camelids clearly show that they originated in north america the fossil record supports that fact there has been nothing discovered ever about the camelids which leads anyone to question the theory of evolution this is the great strength of the theory of evolution from the first tentative ideas of acquired characteristics promoted by lamarck through the natural selection of darwin the ideas of a hereditary put forward by gregor mendel the observations of paleontology and comparative anatomy by richard owen cuvier and others right through to the modern disciplines of genetics and gene sequencing the evidence has grown the theory has been refined but continually the evidence has pointed to the same indisputable conclusion. This is why evolution is a fact, as solid as any other theory, because the weight of evidence in support of it across every branch of science makes it inconceivable that any future discovery could disprove it. The mechanisms by which evolution progresses might be reconsidered, but that random mutation and natural selection, the cornerstone of Darwin's hypothesis, are the main driving forces of the continual process of change within all animal populations is demonstrable and indisputable and this is why ken ham and his creationists fail every time they claim that science cannot tell us about the past and then invent their own past based on their blind faith in an ancient text with very limited descriptions of that past to hold to the book they have to have all of the camelids in the world originating from a bottleneck pair walking off Noah's Ark in the Middle East. But science, including the fossil record and genetics, proves that this never happened. Of course, can scientists know all these facts and have to ignore them, hide them from their audience, or plain lie about them to sustain what they have decided is the ultimate truth? When it takes a thousand lies to uphold a truth, what does it tell you about that truth? Thank you for watching.